so much. Good morning. Welcome to Magnify. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. We're going to start by singing to our great God. So if you would stand and join us. And we know that today is a joyful day for some and for some it brings up a lot of sorrow. So wherever you are this morning, we're here to worship the God who sees us, who knows us, who cares about us. So let's sing to him this morning. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. 
thankful for your word. We ask that by the power of your spirit, you would help us to embody these words, that we would seek you first. Sing these words. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. All will be added. All will be added. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. All will be added. someday every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that you are Lord I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus his name I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus
Please pray with me now. Dear Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to gather together, to worship you, to learn, and it really is an opportunity. During this spring season, it reminds me of your grace and your love. Plants that appeared dead are suddenly blooming with new life. Similarly, here in your congregation. People who appear dead are suddenly blooming with new life and producing fruit. Every one of us deserve death. and Every one of us have been in that spot. So we confess our sin. I confess my sin and we confess our corporate sin. And we thank you for your redeeming grace, your gift, dying on the cross for us, and then rising again, paying the penalty for our sin we know that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us those sins. We pray now for the various issues that members of our church are facing. For those who have health concerns, for those who have lost loved ones, and for our nation, our world, we know that none of these problems are too big or too small for you. You know what each one of these issues are as so we lay those at your feet. Pray for our missionaries this week, Zeb and Ariana Potter in Chicago. We thank you for their ministry, witnessing to the youth in the Chicagoland area through their Good News Club. We thank you for the way that has spread, the many attendees that they've had. In fact, so many this summer for their five-day Bible club that they're looking for additional hosts so we pray that you would provide those hosts and that the youth who hear the gospel would hear it, receive it, and then be witnesses for you in that area. We pray for Zeb and Ariana and their family as they raise Ember. Pray for wisdom and strength, that you would continue to grow their family and strengthen them and grow their ministry there in Chicago. Now we pray for our time together. We pray that you would help us not only to listen and learn, but to apply what is taught in our lives that our ministry, our testimony wouldn't just be written or vocal, that we would live out our testimonies in our daily, daily lives, that people would see us and know, know what is different about us, and that people would come to you through our lives. 
in your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I'm so happy that you're here worshiping with us. My name is Matt, and I'm one of the volunteers here at Magnify. We are so incredibly grateful for the things that are going on in this church and the ministry that is taking place through our church. We have our annual meeting taking place on May 22. That's going to be here at 6 p.m. In addition to celebrating all the great things that God has done through our church over the last year, we're also going to be voting on several important issues, including new members, the budget for the next year, and adopting Ray Saban as a pastor. And if you don't know Ray, he's the director of students at the Northview campus. So there will be more information on our website to do with that meeting, but in the meantime, please save that date. One of the other ways that we worship God and show our gratitude to him for the amazing things that he is doing in and through our church is through our financial giving. And we do that either online or using any of the ways that you see here on the screen. Thank you for your partnership. And now we're going to continue our worship together by learning from the word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Good morning. If you have a Bible with you, <clears throat> please turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. And while you're turning, I'd like to wish all of you mothers a happy Mother's Day. And as was said earlier, it's, uh, you know, it can be a mixed day in a lot of ways. But the reality is that uh, ultimately um, society flourishes because of godly mothers. So thank you for all who are part of that, even though we all do it imperfectly. Man, thanks for all the work and for striving towards that end. John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into an, a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments, and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, 
that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Every once in a while, uh, a sermon is picked for its topic and its text and its general outline way in advance. In fact, that's how we do all the sermons, but every once in a while, current events kind of bring unexpectedly, the week of, kind of bring into focus uh, a, a strong overlap of what you were planning on preaching on and what's happening in the world today. Today is one of those Days because the subject or the title is for the life of the world. We want to talk about life and what it doesn't mean to not only understand what life is, but how do we give life and how do we bring life to the world? And one could imagine somebody from another planet coming to our world and coming into our culture uh, being uh, quite confused about what life is. And they may hear and see and read people being very concerned about the loss of human life in a place like the Ukraine. <clears throat> but then they also might hear uh, and read and hear great concern about the loss of the ability to take life in the womb. And they may look at these and say, which is it? What is life? And how and why is it important? So today, as we get into our subject today, we are going to take time to just sit on that idea of life and how do we give life to the world. And we're a church who believes in the sanctity of human life. We are pro-life. But what does that mean? What is the foundation of that reality? So by the end, hopefully that will be clear to all of us. But also with this subject matter and, and this being Mother's Day, it brings another layer to it. And as I thought about the story we're in and I thought about it being Mother's Day, I instantly thought of a painting that uh, is familiar to me and probably many of you out there. And this painting is, uh, was done by an artist who lived in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And she's very unique in the world of painting. This painting, if you're not familiar with it, this is a masterpiece. It's worth millions of dollars if it were put on sale. But the painter is you know, fairly unique. The painter's unique because she's a woman. Mary Cassatt, and she painted this at a time when there weren't a lot of female painters that were given any type of recognition. She's also unique because she's an American painter. And she's also an Impressionist painter. And if you think about how many female American Impressionist painters that painted masterpieces are out there, you will come up with exactly one. That's Mary Cassatt. She has done many, many paintings, but a lot of her paintings deal with children, and in particular, mothers with children. Now, I show you this painting because I want you to look at it, and I want to ask you two questions. First of all, as you look at that painting, who in this picture, there's two people, who, who has the, more, the most power in this picture? Who has the most power? Well, clearly, the mother does. She's bigger, more capable in, in the stage of life and everything. She has the power. But my second question is this. How is she using her power? I think when we dwell on that question, we begin to see the power of this painting, but also we'll see how it intertwines with our story this morning. You see, because she is 
a grown, capable woman. Is, is what she doing right here, is this a maximum use of her capacity? I mean, she's probably, we don't know how smart she is, but she probably is, is capable of far more complex and intricate tasks than this. She has some sort of gifts in, in her life that maybe she could use elsewhere. Is she in this single act uh, operating at the maximum ability of her capacity? Because when I think about my vocation, I've always, uh, and, and talked with others, there seems to be this idea that we, we must maximize our capacity of what we're able to do. Is she doing that? No. But does that distract her? Does that keep her from being fully present in what she's doing? No. How is she using her power? Well, now let's get into our story, and we're going to frame uh, the action. John is going to frame the action right from the first verse here, and he says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Love them to the end. Jesus knew that his hour to come, was he's on it. He's going to be executed for the sin of the world. And yet, despite that being on him, he loved his own until the end. In other words, there's no change in his disposition of love for his followers. In fact, his love for his followers is what drives him to endure the agony that his hour is going to put upon him. And the events around him and happening to him do not change his love. John gives us a little more background. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, and we'll pick this up in just a second. So, but this is a detail that John wants us to have as we enter this story. The heart of Jesus, or Judas is already corrupted. And the plan, the trajectory that Judas is going to go on is already set. So John wants us to know that as we proceed. And now we get to the action of the story. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. I want to pause here for just a second. And uh, I, I highlighted this rose from supper. And we'll get back to this, why this is important. But sometimes I think we get in our mind that uh, a, a different sequence of events. It's very important to know that they all came in, they went up to eat, and dinner had begun. And what is tradition and practice and good manners in the ancient Near East is when you come into the house or as a guest or your own house, because you wear sandals and the streets are just very dirty and dusty, the first thing you do is you wash your own feet. And if you're going to more of a public gathering or a larger gathering or, or somebody prominent's household, there is a servant there to wash your feet for you. And that didn't take place here. But I also want us to understand um, all things into his hand. The Father had given all things into Jesus' hand. Now think of that painting. Who had the power? In this story, who has the power at this moment? Well, Jesus does. And the question is, how is he going to use it? All right, back to the story. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' 
feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So he takes off his outer garment, probably a prayer shawl, a very spiritual garment, and in its place, he wraps a towel so he can do this washing. Puts down something spiritual and picks up something practical for the washing. And he gets up and the, the food's out. They're eating. And now he gets up and he's going to do this. And I want you to think of his posture. What would it, where would he be to wash everybody's feet while he'd be at their feet? And I want you, us to think of the stories that came just before this story, one in particular, where Mary puts perfume, expensive perfume, on Jesus' feet. She's at his feet. But now Jesus is at everybody else's feet. And that posture is very important. He has power, but his posture seems to move contrary to the power he has. And now he comes to Peter. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward, you will understand. So he came to Simon Peter. Peter wasn't the first person's feet that he washed. How many others? We don't know exactly, but probably John was one of the first. And when he comes to him, he tells him, he, he objects, he's surprised, but afterward, you will understand why I'm doing this. After what? After supper? After my teaching? There might be some understanding. After the cross? Yeah. After your own betrayal, Peter? Yeah. Peter, like you and I, is going to have multi-levels of understanding, and they're just going to get deeper and deeper and closer to his own heart. Well, Peter is going to object further, but Jesus will push forward. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. Well, there are two aspects to the story for us to see this morning. And one is the theological aspect. There is a theological teaching in what Jesus has said here about washing the entire body versus just washing the feet. And the theological terms are justification and sanctification. Justification is when, through faith alone, you and I become justified. We're made righteous. We are now a child of God. There's nothing we can add to it. It's done. And it's done by the sovereign hand of God moving in us. So when Jesus said, oh, if you've already been washed, if you're already justified, if you already have expressed sincere faith in me, you don't need to do that over and over again. However, you and I, when we do that, we aren't perfect. We still sin, even though we're believers. Ah, and then we need a type of cleansing, which is like sanctification. And sanctification means the Holy Spirit, as we bend to the Holy Spirit's leading in our life, he will help us to be more and more Christ-like. We will not perfect ourselves at the end of our life. That's already been done by Jesus. But our salvation means something in this life too. And so the washing of the feet is like sanctification. And Peter, you need your feet washed. <laughs> you don't even know why right now, but you need it. And so that's a, a truth, but there's 
There's something going on with the exchange and everything that's being said and all the events. And so to, to help me understand it, I just, I took the, the, the diagram, I made a diagram of the interchange between Jesus and Peter. And it goes something like this. Jesus, do this. Peter, no. Jesus, do this or nothing. Peter, do this plus extra. Jesus, no. Right? Is that right? That's what's happening. And I think when, when I drew it out like this, I was like, wow, who's in charge? Peter keeps calling him Lord, but he thinks he's in charge. And what is Peter doing? I mean, at one level, it's spiritually, oh, it's Jesus. I'll do, man, then give me extra if it's for you. I couldn't serve, you can't serve me. And it sounds like he's so enamored with Jesus that this is a spiritually elevated place. But it's not. Particularly when we think of the context from the other gospels of what's going on as they come to this dinner, what, what were the disciples doing? They're, they were arguing who's, who's first among them. And in light of that, it becomes obvious what Peter is doing. Peter is trying to advance himself over his others. And in their pettiness, each other, the disciples have made each other a competitor and a block to their own position of prominence. Peter's after power. He's trying to advance himself over the others there. And going through this, this helps me answer a question I had in my studies. What is the difference between Peter and Mary? And by Mary, I mean Mary from a story before this. Why does Mary get to anoint Jesus' feet with the perfume, yet when Peter says, I'll wash your feet, Jesus says, no. What's the difference? Let's go back to our diagram. Well, when we see the interchange, I think the difference becomes clear. Peter is about prideful service. Mary is about true worship. And now we need to think of the sequence of events, how, what happened again. They all go up to dinner, they sit down and they eat. Jesus doesn't get up till the middle of dinner. Any one of them, including Peter, could have noticed, should have noticed, I'm sure they noticed that there's nobody here to wash our feet. And any one of them could have said, hey, everybody come around here, I'll wash your feet. Since there's nobody here to wash our feet, I'll wash your feet. And in Peter's case, his insistence that, oh, I'm humble, Jesus, I'll wash your feet. Jesus is, sees right through that. Peter, you had a shot. The object isn't to elevate me at the, and ignore the people around you. You're to serve everybody like I would serve them. And that's what it means to love me and follow me. You had your shot. Everybody had their shot. It's as if Jesus is letting this play out to see if anybody will do it. He didn't, but it sounds like he's really into Jesus. What Jesus is saying, <laughs> you keep acting like this, you will have no part of me. Let's go back to the dinner now. And Jesus begins to teach. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. For so I am. You guys, you are thinking rightly. And the words 
that are coming out of your mouth that are so important are correct. But it's not just about talk. And so Jesus addresses their actions compared to words. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. They should have been on it when they walked in. They should have been crashing into each other to get the basin. And any one of them could have done it. And Jesus is saying, my followers are looking for opportunities to serve each other. My followers are looking for somebody who needs life injected into them. They're looking for it. And they're looking for it in the smallest, most insignificant places. You guys fight with each other over who's the best. And in doing so, you miss the fact that you all need life. And you all have a position and power and opportunity to give life, and you passed it by. Your ambition has clouded your understanding of me. My followers will have an awareness of the need for care. And this story tells us it's usually right under our nose. It's right in our own household, in our own workplace. It's the people who often irritate us most. Jesus goes on, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Peter tried to be greater than his master. He doesn't think that. He thinks he's more spiritual. He's not. And the same is true for you and I. And oftentimes, the second, the millisecond, the thought comes that we have some sort of spiritual high ground with each other, we're following Peter's path. Jesus is saying, look for opportunities to give life, not for opportunities to elevate yourself. He goes on again, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. What does he mean? Who does he send? Somebody who needs life is put into your life. And if you respond, it's like we're, now we're loving Jesus. We're honoring him by giving life to the people around us. That's what he wants. And when we do that, then we're united with the Father through Christ. So everyone here in person or on our live stream, we all have gifts and position and a certain level of power. And sometimes we have power by position in a family or in the workplace, in the community in general, or sometimes we have power by wealth, or sometimes we have power by gifts that we can do. And God gives us whatever we have it was given to us by God so we could bring life to the world. So you take something like our work. And everybody here who's an adult and is working, you're in a position where you have gifts to do the job you're doing. The question is, will we give life to the world through that work? Well, the first thing we do in that job is we work hard. 
and we do it well. That's one foundational way to give life to the world. But then there's the people with which we work with and work for. And are we seeing them as opportunities to give life to? Or are they a burden? Are they a block? Are they a pain? And ultimately, as we give life, the way we do things begins to proclaim Christ. And we'll do it with our words, but like Jesus said, his teaching in the story, our actions must be life-giving for our words of Christ being the source of life to resonate. On my own life, every time I think of subjects like these, I, from time to time, I just do a self-reflection. And I go back 20, no, probably 30 years ago, I remember being introduced to the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in there, uh, early on in the book, it talked about two circles. And in that book were two circles. And um, if, you, if you've been here a while, you know I, I bring these out from time to time. But I bring them out in my private life uh, much more frequently. There's a circle of influence and a circle of concern. Everyone in here has both of these circles. The circle of influence is who in our life do we truly have influence over? And the answer is most of your circle of influence is, is just yourself. And we try and change the people around us, but it's very difficult. In fact, it's usually impossible. But then there's a circle of concern, and that's uh, those things in our life that we think about and consume our time and our energy and and our anxiety and our fear and anger. Um, uh, But those are things that we really have no control over. It's okay, or maybe they're important matters often, and sometimes they're not, but we really don't have any control over them. And now in our culture, our culture brings us, every day we get truckloads of, of stories and information that really we have no influence over. But the, the dump truck dumps story after story for us to read and think about and talk about and get energized about. Let's think about marriage for a second. Do you know, did you know that Johnny Depp is having troubles in his marriage? He is. It's in the top of the news every day. I don't even read the article. I just see the headlines. I'm like, why, why is this top of the news? It will move ahead, up above the war in the Ukraine. Do I have any influence? None. But the, there's a powerful truth that we'd rather focus on his marriage than our marriage. But that's the only one I really have influence, influence over. So our, our circle of concern or circle of influence is quite small and it must uh, consist primarily of ourself. And we can influence others by serving them and loving them. But we don't want to do that, and we just want to change them. And so we try other techniques. So we think about Peter. Peter's out here. Oh, he's concerned about Jesus' mission and what Jesus looks like and who's going to attack him. And, oh, that'll never happen. And he's out here. And Jesus is saying, Peter, you're missing it. You're so concerned with what is, is not your concern that you, f- you failed to wash your, your friend's feet. You missed your heart. And in missing your heart, you missed your team, your friends. And in missing them, you miss me. So as I get into this in my own life, 
I have four questions that I, I work through. And um, I'm going to walk us through these. And if you are interested in doing something similar, you can find them on our app. And they'll be put up there, I think, tomorrow when the sermon's put up or later today. The first question I ask myself is, what roles has God put me in? This is a very important process. And it seems like a simple one and almost too simple to even do. But from time to time, to even write down all my roles and positions I've been put in. And sometimes we talk about the five Ps around here of of the roles we have. And the first one is I'm a person. I'm an image bearer of God. And so the first role and the first area of concern I have is myself. But then, if I'm a follower of Christ, my next role is priest. I'm a priest. Now, the Old Testament, they needed a priest to mediate God to to humanity. But once Christ came and the Spirit was, Holy Spirit was given to us, he says, we're all priests. But that means now, I mediate God to the world around me. I acknowledge these two realities and they must go together. That's what a priest does. So I have that role. And then if you're married, you have a partner. So I have a partner, I have a wife. And I'm a parent, so I have that role. And I have a job, so I'm a professional. But then... I have a lot more roles than that, and it's kind of amazing when I start listing them out, how I'm a neighbor, I'm a friend, I'm a son, I'm a son-in-law, sometimes I've been a coach, sometimes I've been a teacher, and on and on, and to list those out is very helpful, because every one of those roles, we have agency, but every one of those roles, when, God, when Christ says, you know, who I bring to you, when you receive who I bring to you, he, he is sovereign over that. And all those roles are there. And each one is an arena in which I am called to give life. Second question now. Well, who has God put into my life through these roles? Now you take each category and you start thinking of the people in there. The partner is easy. It's my wife. And the parent, some of them are easy, but if you're a sibling, well, you have siblings in your life. You want to go out and do great things for the kingdom, but you miss your siblings or you miss your own kids. You miss your own spouse. We look first and foremost right at our primary roles and who God has put in there. This is kingdom activity. And the truth is, to be pro-life begins here. It's not about a cause down the road. That's very important. But it must be here first and foremost, and that becomes evidence that one, Christ is at the center, but it also shapes how we go about doing all the rest. Pro-life means, oh, first and foremost, giving life to those who are most proximate to me, the closest to me. They're in my roles. They're right there. They're at the table with dirty feet. It's right there. Don't miss this. Don't Oh, I love Jesus so much and miss that. Now that brings a third question. Now, in those roles, I've made a list, but who did I miss? Go back over it again with the lens of who am I missing and how can I give life to them and the ones I didn't miss? So you go back through and who and, oh, you know, there's that. Part of my family, I don't talk to anymore because I don't feel like it. There's that coworker, everybody hates them. (laughs) 
But then, do they need life? You may say, yeah, but you don't know them. Just remember this. Think of the events of the story. Jesus washed Judas' feet. Didn't he? He's still there. He hasn't left yet. Jesus washed Judas' feet, knowing what he was going to do. So we, we take invent, go through your day. Okay, uh oh, uh, what do I do at work? I go here and then, here. oh, there's these people. I, f- I forgot about them. Or they're way down the ladder. <laughs> what are ways? How can I give life to them? And the final question, I go back, okay, I miss some people or I'm having a hard time about these people. What is blocking me from seeing and or caring for the people already in my life? And this gets deeper. And this is where Jesus is inviting Peter to go and he's inviting us to go. Don't think, oh, I just missed them. I was busy. No. What, what is causing us to miss the needs around us of people who are dying for life. Why do I withhold it? Why do I only give it to certain people and I withhold it? Well, last week's teaching gives us the answer. I mean, for Peter, if he thinks deeper, it's his ambition. It sounded spiritual. It wasn't because he's ambitious. But last week we saw and went through a story, and at the end it said, oh, many of the leaders believed in Jesus, but they didn't say anything because they loved the glory of man more than the glory of God. And that's where Jesus is inviting us to see where that dynamic is in our life. Some form of that is why we miss people, why we refuse to give life, why we make excuses for not giving life. Let's go back to that painting where we started. I know motherhood is messy. (laughs) Uh, Of all our bath times, I don't think any of them look like this, did they, Leslie? No, The, the bowl would be upside down, the towels everywhere, Kids screaming in the background. Well, well, well. Mary Cassatt was given a gift, and I truly believe she's actually giving life through her giftedness with this painting. She's telling us something powerful. And motherhood on Mother's Day is, it can be quite sentimental. Like it's just good to elevate mother. But what is it about this painting or this image of motherhood that really draws us in? There's something deeper than sentimentality. And it's the reality that someone of her position and her power has saw fit to bring herself down and be totally present and give life to somebody who needs it. And in that, when we see that in motherhood, it is something that resonates, not just because moms are so great, but it finds its home actually in the person of Jesus. And it's through mothers that we often stop and pause and see it reflected. And a lot of times it's because many of us men are out doing something very different. And it's not always men, it can be women, but we're out trying to maximize ourselves. And when we stop and we see something like this, where somebody allows themselves to be less than capacity, and be present and transfer life. It says, this is what the Lord 
has told us all to do. So whether you're a mother or not, it does not matter. This is something that should be part, this is what should drive every Christ follower's life. We are life givers. The world desperately needs life. We desperately needed it. We still do. And we're not here to play power games, to be ambition, to maximize. We're here to give life in the name of Jesus Christ because that's the only place that true life is found. And this is the foundation of what it means to be pro-life. All right, I'd like us all to stand And again, use those four questions or some variation of them this week. We're going to recite uh, Philippian, part of Philippians 2 as our closing prayer together, and then the worship team will lead us one more time. So follow with me. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen.
Amen. Go in peace. Have a wonderful day.